All right. So, last week we started a, uh, a little series on the journey of transformation. I said last week that we were going to do uh, three parts, last week, this week, and, and in a couple weeks. And then I forgot that, uh, that Leighton and Jerrica were coming on, uh, on the 11th. So, part three is going to happen sometime. Let me just say that, sometime, probably not till the end of the summer, but uh, sometime, we'll get to part three. But we're talking about uh, transformation, metamorphosis. We said this last week, uh, tr- I'm going to try not to re-preach too much of what we talked about last week, but if you're just joining us today, um, the word to be transformed or changed in, in the New Testament is this word metamorphosis that we know in in our you know in English as uh, as this process of transforming a a caterpillar to a butterfly, for example, right? And uh, and so this metamorphosis, this transformation, is a work that begins when we come to Christ, when we are born again, born into His kingdom. That process of transformation begins. We come alive as a new creation when we come to Christ. And, uh, and the transformation is not something light or simple, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's changing us into something very new, very different. Just like a creepy caterpillar being changed into a, into a, a butterfly is, is unrecognizably different God is wanting to do, is, is doing that in each one of our lives that follow Christ. But we know, as we said last week, that, that total transformation doesn't happen the moment we give our lives to Christ. Doesn't happen the moment we become followers of Jesus. Um, none of us is yet what we will be. We're in the process of being perfected, completed in our transformation to be like Jesus. But the question we're asking is, if it's not done when it starts, how, how do we participate with that work that God is doing in our lives? How, what's our responsibility in this process of transformation? And, uh, and as we said last week, uh, there are a couple of myths of, uh, uh, that I think we... We have tended in the past to believe this is how transformation happens. Trying not to hide behind, uh, behind flowers here. Um, but transformation doesn't happen by sin management. It's not how transformation happens. I was sinning before, now I need to stop sinning, then I will be holy, then I will be different. And as we said last week, that the problem with that is that was the exact theology of the Pharisees before Jesus arrived on the scene. Right? We don't become holy by just changing the outward things, changing our outward behavior. But something needs to happen on the inside of us to transform who we are and what we are. And trying to... to to be changed by sin management only enslaves us to trying to reach a goal we will never reach. Right? And the second myth we said was transformation by doing ministry. We just keep working harder and harder for Jesus because we think that's what God wants from us. You know, if we're not, if we're not there yet, just keep working harder. Just put in more hours. Just memorize more verses. Just do more stuff. And of course, we're all called to serve Jesus, but we serve from a transformed heart. We don't try to pursue a transformed heart by doing more, right? So how does the process work? How does it work? Last week, um, we started, we started this journey 
Um, but we're continuing today talking about this thing called metanoia. Now, that's a Greek word, another Greek word, like metamorphosis, metanoia. And there's a reason, there's a purpose why I'm not using the English translation at this point. Because the, the English translation we tend to make very shallow, very one-dimensional in how we think about it and talk about it. Metanoia. So I want to I want to read some verses. I want us to look at some verses that have this word metanoia or the verb form of it, metanao, in it to understand how important it is. Okay? So here we go. Mark chapter 1, verse 4. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of metanoia for the forgiveness of sins. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of metanoia for the forgiveness of sins. John's entire ministry was about metanoia. Everything that he preached, everything that he did was about metanoia. So that's, that's kind of important, isn't it? That's, that's, that's pretty significant. So, so let's move on from John to Jesus. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Metanao and believe the good news. Metanao and believe the good news. Then in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. The, uh, the Jewish people who had been listening to Peter preach the very, first, the very first sermon after the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. These people are listening to Peter preach. It says, when the people heard what Peter, what Peter said, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Metanao, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is just a, just a tiny fraction of all the verses in the New Testament that talk about this very, very important word, this important concept of metanoia. Just from these verses that we've read, we may get the idea that metanoia, whatever it is, is really important. Metanoia summed up what John the Baptist's entire ministry was about. Metanoia was the main message of Jesus and the key to becoming a part of the near-at-hand kingdom that he was proclaiming. And when Peter is asked by the people who have come... Who, who are having a spiritual crisis, they're deeply convicted of their sin and their need for a Savior. They ask, what is the remedy? What can we do? And his answer is metanoia. So this, this word metanoia comes from two, two smaller Greek words, meta and nous, which means to change, meta, as in metamorphosis, Right? To change. And noose, which means mind. Sort of. But we don't have time to get into that. It's a whole Greek philosophy thing that we don't have time for this morning. But to change our mind. But we're not talking about something as silly or frivolous as, well, I was going to have the lasagna... But I changed my mind, and now I'm going to have the, the fettuccine Alfredo, 
right? I changed my mind. That's not, that's not what this means. That's not what it's talking about. So if you haven't figured it out yet, the word metanoia in our English translations is almost always translated as repentance. And metanoo, the verb form, is repent. Okay? But metanoia is so much richer than what we often think about when we hear the word repent. It's like looking at one dimension of a three-dimensional object and, and not really understanding what it is. When we use the word repent, I think we often mean you should feel really bad for the bad things you've done and grovel a while and let God know how sorry you are and then maybe he'll pay attention to you. Right? That's often what we mean when we use this word repent. And it sounds so, um, you know, when you tell someone to, that they need to repent, it's like very, it sounds very offensive. It sounds very attacking them. And yes, confessing our sins and our failures and changing our ways is an aspect of metanoia, but it's so much more. I want to share a verse with you that the word metanoia isn't quite there. It almost is. It sort of is. The concept is there. But I think it helps us a lot. And it's this, this verse from Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this age. Most of our English translations here say don't be conformed to the world but this is a better translation in in the new testament world is usually cosmos which is not what's here it's it's eon or age so so don't be conformed to this age we live in a particular age right we live in we live in this age But when Jesus came, the age to come broke into this age. The heavenly reality, the age to come broke into this world, this age, this time. And, and so Paul is saying, don't be conformed to this age. But instead, be transformed. There's our big word, metamorphosis. Don't be met, uh, but be metamorphized, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's, kind of, it's almost like the changing of your mind, but it's, it's, it's very much related. The renewing of your noose, of your mind. So that you may discern what is the good pleasing and perfect will of God. We'll come back to this in a moment, but we can't even discern God's will until this process of transformation begins to happen in our lives. Right? Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. We once belonged to this age, but now we belong to the age to come. Right? This age is not our home. We belong in the age to come. We don't fit here anymore. And it's okay that we don't for now. But, but, but there's some angst, there's some, there's some struggle against the, this age because it doesn't fit anymore, right? The new creation, the new heaven and earth have begun already when Jesus came into this world. He announced the nearness of the kingdom of God. The new age is here. 
right? The, the age to come has come. The two realities are incompatible. The present age, the Bible tells us, is ruled by Satan. He's actually called the God of this age, right? This age is ruled by Satan and has his markings all over it. The unfortunate display at the Olympic opening ceremony, right, where a group of transgender drag queens posed in mockery of the Last Supper, right, was, was just, um, was revealing, was revealing of the reality, left no question left, that the system of this age is opposed to the gospel. And it continues to wage war against Yahweh, against God and his purposes for humans. To openly violate one of the most sacred moments in the Christian faith was, wasn't a mistake, it was very intentional. And it was declaring something, right? Jesus said we would be hated by this age. You will be hated by this world. It's okay, actually, that we're hated by this world because it means we're walking with Jesus, right? But our battle is not with those people. It's not with the drag queens. It's not with, it's not with people. We always have to remember that. Our battle is not with people. But it's with the spiritual principalities and powers that drive the mindset of this age. And Paul says we must no longer be conformed to it. So what is metanoia? Well, I want to suggest to you a couple things this morning. Metanoia is... Loyalty to a new king. The starting place for becoming, the starting place for coming to Christ the Lord is to recognize that he is Christ and he is Lord. I'm going to say that one again. The starting place for coming to Christ the Lord is to recognize that he is Christ and he is Lord. Christ means anointed. He is the anointed one, the king, the Lord, right? He's king of an empire that we have now entered as followers of Jesus that is an entirely different culture and way of living than we have known all of our lives. Colossians 1 verses 12 to 14 says this, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you. I don't know if you feel qualified, but folks, if you know Jesus, you are qualified. You've been qualified. Who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of His holy people in the kingdom of light. For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We have changed our citizenship, folks. We have a new passport. We live in the kingdom of Jesus, and it's very different than the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of this age, right? In sharing the gospel, we have often used, as evangelicals, we've often used this language Asking people to invite Jesus into their lives. To invite Jesus into their hearts. As if you're doing him a favor by inviting him to the party in your head. Right? Like Jesus, I, I, you made the list. I'm going to invite you into my life. But the Bible never uses this language. Okay? Okay? You will not find invite Jesus into your heart or invite Jesus into your life in the Bible. You just won't. 
But instead, the Bible says that you have been invited by Jesus. You have been invited by Jesus to metanoia, to repent, to turn, to change your mind, to change your frame of reality from being king or queen of your own life and living in the dominion of darkness that that brings, dying to that whole system of rebellion and taking Jesus as your King and Lord in the kingdom of light. That is very different than inviting Jesus into my life. But accepting his invitation to repent, to metanoia, to change our minds and our realities and enter into his kingdom. Claim him as King and Lord. This means my life is now under new ownership. Everything changes. I am being renovated for the better from the inside out. He is knocking out walls. He's pouring new forms. He's... I saw that. <laughs> you guys are pouring new forms, aren't you? Um, he's renovating... I mean, it's... Putting a new basement under a house, lifting it up, that's, that's pretty serious uh, renovation. Eh? But he, he's renovating us from the inside out. The garbage that I believed that got me into this mess has to go. Right? The structures that I used to trust in all of them need to be questioned. What I thought I knew isn't reality in this kingdom. Everything needs to, to go, and I need to be changed from the inside out. Yes, this means that we need to repent of sin and our patterns of selfishness and perversion and greed that we've lived by. But metanoia is so much deeper and life-altering than just repenting of sin. It cuts much deeper and it leads to so much more freedom and beauty when we metanoia. It doesn't just take things away, it gives better things to live for. We are not diminished by metanoia, we are enriched beyond imagining when we repent, when we metanoia. And we gain far more than we ever lose in the deal. Loyalty to a new king. Secondly, questioning our basic assumptions. Everything I thought was important Everything I thought I knew has to be questioned. We have been raised in the culture of this age from the moment you were born until the moment you came to Christ, whenever that was for you. For some of you, it was an hour ago. For some of you, it was 20 years ago. For some of you, it was 50 years ago. Whenever you came to Christ, you were raised in this age and taught how to survive and how to live in this age for all of that time. But when you came to Christ, everything that you learned to that moment needed to be unlearned. Metanoia means taking the posture of Jesus, you are right, I am wrong. At every turn, in every conflict, you are right, I am wrong. Everything I've assumed, everything I've believed, if it's out of sync and out of alignment with the kingdom of God, then it is wrong. And I need to own it. Wherever my desires, my habits, my attitudes 
are at odds with what the Bible tells me God's priorities are, I am wrong. I don't get to rewrite the Bible. It needs to rewrite me. Metanoia, repentance, is not just a one-time thing. Oh yeah, I repented 30 years ago. I've just been cruising with Jesus ever since. It's not how it works. Metanoia is a way of life. You are becoming a human of the age to come rather than a human of this age. You are being made fit to live in a new heaven and a new earth. Like a goldfish being made fit to soar with eagles. Right? The, the reality that made sense to you before, that, that fit before, that felt right before, will no longer fit or be right for where you're going. As we said, we can't even discern the will of God until we begin to be transformed, to be renewed, to have our mind changed. The more transformed we become, the, the clearer and clearer God's will becomes for us. It would be so much easier if God just did it at once when we prayed that prayer, wouldn't that be so much easier? If God just did all the transforming at once. But God knows what he's doing. And think about this. If, if all of the stretching and struggling and bending and breaking that we undergo in the process of being transformed, if God did all of that at once, I don't think we would survive it. Right? And some things have to be learned slowly for them to take. Some things have to be learned over and over, if you're like me. Right? We have to learn it over and over transforming our mind because we it's so easy to slide back into our old mindset our old way of thinking and then suddenly we get a wake-up call and it's like oh why did i slip back there again i need to think like a kingdom person not like a person of this world but when we we watch commercials watch TV shows, we hear music, we see news, we, the things of the world and it activates sometimes our old ways of thinking and we just fall back into it. And we wake up, oh no, I'm not of this age. Right? If my people who are called by my name, in other words, I'm their king. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. That's metanoia. Folks, can I encourage you today? Sometimes we look, we look forward at what we know God, or at least we have a, a glimpse or a hint of what we know God wants us to be, and we get so frustrated and so discouraged because it's so far out there, so far ahead of us. But I want to encourage you today. Look, just, I mean, we don't want to live looking back, but just take a look in the rearview mirror. Look where you came from. Look what you were. 
Look how far he's brought you. You are in the process of being transformed. And as you've cooperated with him, as you've said yes to him and no to you, I'm wrong, you're right. He is changing you. You are becoming something new. You're closer than you were the day you came to Christ. I'm jumping ahead here, but let me say this to encourage you. No matter where we are at, no matter where we're at in our journey, when Jesus returns and we look in his face, 1 John 3 tells us that we will be transformed completely. The job will be done. It says we don't yet know what we will be, but we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When you are face to face with the glory of Jesus, you will be in that moment completed. Right? Isn't that exciting? Learning to live in the kingdom is like when someone's learning a new language. At, at first, you have to translate. You have to think of the, the phrase in your own language, translate it. You know, I, I'm going to the store. Okay, je vais au magasin. Okay. Je vais au magasin, right? Like, you have to translate it. But the, the, the longer you go and the more you work at it, the more, you're, the more you're engaging with the process of learning a new reality, the new, a new language, there comes a moment when you start to actually think thoughts in that language. You know, we're, we're often, you know, our first thought the beginning of the transformation, our first thoughts are thoughts of the world. And we're like, no, that's, that's, not, that's not a Jesus thought. That's not a kingdom thought. Okay, well, how do I think, you know, I need to change how I think about this. Oh, yeah, okay, right? But the longer we go, as God does this process in us, we will actually find that we start thinking kingdom thoughts. We start thinking like a child of the king. I have one more point. It's probably going to take longer than... Uh, let me just touch on it. Mortification. Isn't that a scary word? Mortification. Colossians 3. I'll try to do this quickly. Colossians 3. Since then, verse 1, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Right? So, so Paul is saying here to set our hearts and our attention and our affections on things above because we are now from the above world. Right? We're now from the heavenly world. So we need to set our hearts and our affections and our minds upon the things of heaven. Right? Don't live below your status, beloved. Don't live below your status. Don't let your appetites and your emotions determine your reality. But bring your appetites, your affections, your emotions into obedience to your new life. So Paul goes on to say, Verse, verse three, 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, mortify, some translations say. 
I just like that word, so I used it. But mortification. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Right? Your, the drives from this, from this age. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge in knowledge in the image of its creator you and i are not a victim of our old self sometimes we live as victims of our old self Oh, I just, I just keep thinking these thoughts. And I just keep, you know, they just keep coming at me. And I guess I'm just a victim of these thoughts. There's actually things that we can do to put those things to death. To put off our old selves and to put on our new selves. And we use this language, put on. Oh, it's such a put on. We mean it's phony, Right? not who they really are they're just pretending they're just it's just a put on putting on your new self is not being phony but it's leaning into who Jesus says you are behaving according to the truth and leading our desires and our emotions to eventually come into alignment don't let our emotions or our desires lead us but lead them that's what we're called to do by putting on the new self what the bible says you are you are the righteousness of god in christ jesus Second Corinthians 5, 21. For God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, you not could be, might be, will be, Jesus has made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And if we can get in our thinker, in our noose, not, not our noose, the one that we were talking about. Um, if we can get in our thinker, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Would the righteousness of God do that? Would the righteousness of God say that? Would the righteousness of God throw a fit over that? I want to put on the new self. And not live below my status. The righteousness of God. In Christ Jesus. Let's stand.
So it's pretty heavy stuff today. Thought-provoking, challenging. But we don't want it to stay just heavy stuff in our head, right? But to come to Jesus, whether you're a brand new Christian, just following him for a short time, or whether you've been at this thing for, for 50 years, I want to suggest to you that, that all of us probably need to have some conversations with him that go like, Jesus, you're right. I'm wrong. You're king. I'm not. Have your way in me. Change my heart. So I want to pray with you. And in a few moments, as Bob uh, re releases us, I want to encourage us to uh, consider taking just a few moments, at least, leaning in and having a conversation with Jesus. God, I thank you for your amazing love that you are in the process of changing me, of changing us into something spectacular, into something amazing. I know that one day we will see Jesus face to face and the job will be done. But God, in this moment, in this space, in this uh, this stage of our lives, God, each one of us, are in process. We thank you for your grace that is poured out on our lives. Thank you that we know a Savior, that we know you as our hope. But God, I pray that you would give us the courage and the strength to metanoia today, to change our hearts, to change our minds, to say yes to you. Bend our knee to the king and let you be king. We repent and we turn to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God we're still under construction. What would Jesus do? What would he say? God bless you. May we take time this morning to continue to wait upon him. And if you need special prayer today, we would just invite you to come. Members of the Breakthrough team will be here to pray with you and to encourage you. God bless you. As we continue to wait upon the Lord. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit.
renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Oh, cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me oh cast me not cast me not away from thy presence O lord take not thy holy spirit from me store unto me joy And renew a right spirit within me. Oh, renew a right spirit within me.